According to the theologian Leslie Newbegin, there is an engraved text in the ruins of Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire. And this engraved text reads, here monks gathered every Sunday to hear a sermon from the abbot, except on Trinity, owing to the difficulty of the subject. Now, I don't know how true that is, but the idea that these monks would attend Sunday services, but they skip Trinity Sunday because it's too difficult. And yet today I'm going to talk about the Trinity. And I know it's not easy, but it is worth it. Another theologian wrote, our first task in getting the gospel right is getting the God of the gospel right. Although I would argue it's not so much about getting him right, as about knowing him deeply. And out of that knowing, we are changed. And our community is changed. As many of you here know, the church is going through a three-year, a two-year program called Ethos. And it involves some of the leaders from the church attending uh, lectures online, meeting with other people. We have a prayer team led by Carolyn. Carolyn's helping with the prayer for that. And it's a way of us as a church thinking about what God is doing, thinking about who God is, and what that means for us as a church in terms of ongoing mission. And part of, of that ethos two-year course is, is actually going back, to, going back to school, as it were, and thinking about who God is, not just making assumptions, but thinking about who God is according to Scripture and looking at what other people have thought about that over time. And so today, I'm speaking on the Trinity. And for those of you who know a little bit about tr the Trinity and the thinking behind God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you may be asking, well, oh, you know, we could get bogged down in theological debate about three persons in the Godhead. And, uh, well, haven't we got a mission to get on with? Why do we need to worry about that? And I agree, we've got a mission to get on with. So that's why we're not going to get bogged down, and if you thought this morning you would, but you're not, get bogged down in debates about the Athanasian Creed, which I know you've all brought a copy of you, with you this morning, just in case, or the ancient heresy of modalism, or Arianism. We're not going to talk about that this morning. I know it disappoints you. But today I'm going to speak of God as Trinity. God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Followers of Jesus are by definition drawn into the deep and the perfect relationship of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We often talk about a relationship with Jesus, but I hope by the end of, of, this, of, of this short uh, message you will realise that in a way that's inaccurate. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, by definition, you are drawn into that relationship between Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And here in John, we see that on show. In the passage in John that I'm going to read to you, we have to remember that Jesus has just been crucified. And on Easter morning, he had appeared, resurrected to Mary in the garden, Mary Magdalene. And she'd gone to the disciples to tell them the news. And then that evening, so that same day in the evening, we find the same disciples huddled together in a locked room in fear. So I'm going to read from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. As the Father has sent me, 
I am sending you, said Jesus, in that short passage. Receive the Holy Spirit. There we go. The Trinity. After the four Gospels, you will find the book of Acts. And it's the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and it describes the history of the early church. And it's often called, especially in Pentecostal circles, it was often called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it was only the, the achievement of these apostles was only possible through the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. The Holy Spirit shows up in Acts. Yet here we find in John, described and acted out by Jesus, the Acts of the Trinity. The Father sending the Son. The Son acting out that sending by sending his followers and breathing the Holy Spirit upon them. I don't know what your, your feelings are about the Trinity. There are many little pictures to describe the Trinity. And, and one of the challenges with some of those pictures is that they can be so simple that they can fall into some old heresies. And that's one of the challenges. And whenever you're speaking of the Trinity, you will never be perfectly accurate because the Trinity is a mystery. We can seek out, we can delve deep, we can try and learn, but ultimately, how God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is an eternal mystery. If we could work it out and make it a logical thing, we wouldn't be God. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But just remember, by trying, we sometimes trip up. And that's okay, because God recognises that. So it can be tempting to have these images of what the Trinity is like. And let's say, for instance, you might have the, an image of the Trinity a bit like a traditional family. And heaven as the family home. So in this family home, everything is lovely. Everything is cosy. Everything is, is how it should be. We have the Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's almost like they're, they're seated around a table in heaven where they have complete control. And the Father says to the Son, I am sending you to that world. Basically, it's time to go out to work. So off goes the Son, Jesus, into the world to do his Father's work, having to leave this wonderful home of heaven. And then when the job is finished, crucified, resurrected, he ascends back to heaven, to the family home. And he's glad he's back because heaven is wonderful and the world was not. And then they suddenly realise it's the Holy Spirit's turn, so off the Holy Spirit goes, from the lovely family home, down to the grime and the dirt of this world. Off he goes. I don't know if this is your image of the Trinity, where it's, it's like God sends the Son out of this really nice environment called heaven and watches him go and says, don't worry, he'll be back soon. And maybe every now and then they have a phone call just to check they're okay in prayer. And you may be thinking that's, that's a bit of a silly way of looking at it, but the way some people speak about the Trinity, it's almost like that. Jesus is down there. The Father's up there with the Holy Spirit. And eventually they'll kind of swap with the Holy Spirit. See, we need to get out of that kind of mentality where the Father sends the Son on his own. Off you go, Jesus. You'll go, you go on mission. And then come back when it's all over. To fully understand the Trinity, we need to begin to understand the interrelated nature of Jesus and the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is not like an earthly family. The Father himself was involved in what Jesus was doing. Jesus said this in John chapter 5, and it gives us a different perspective then of this idea of heaven, Father, and Holy Spirit up there, Jesus down here, and every now and then they communicate. Because Jesus said this about his Father. My Father... In John chapter 5, my father is always at work 
to this very day. And I too am working. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So the father was not sitting at home with his feet up, waiting for the son to come back. The father was involved with the work of Jesus, showing Jesus all he did, like a, like a good father talking his son through what he does in order that his son may also do that work. And not only that, the father was working while Jesus was working. Jesus said, my father's always at work. He hasn't taken the day off because I'm here. It's not like we can't both work at the same time, so one day I'm working and the next day my father works. My father is always at his work to this very day, said Jesus. Even in his walk on earth and his life among the people, these were not the acts of Jesus, they were the acts of the Trinity, lived out in Jesus. Each of the Trinity having their own roles. Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. They each have their own roles. But according to Jesus, they are each at work and involved in each other's lives. If you want to think about roles, and again, if we try to box who the Father is and who the Son is and who the Holy Spirit is, what, what you'll find is that they don't ever fit a box that you try and put them in. But, but let's just, for the sake of argument, suggest some roles. The Father creates, sustains. The Father covenants. And we can see that through, throughout the people of God's history where, where God the Father draws his people together by covenanting with them through Abraham and through Noah and through many others. The Son incarnates, that means becomes flesh, allows us to physically see and touch who God is if we'd have been walking at the same time as Jesus. The Son mediates, so the Son acts on our behalf to the Father and he redeems, he buys us back and brings us back into communion with God. And the Spirit empowers and fills fills people with God's own presence. But each shares, each cooperates, each is involved in and unifies the other. It's not that they end up doing each other's jobs. It's that in order to fulfill their roles, they need each other. What if church could be like that? What if we could have our roles, those things we are doing and we are called to do within our community, but also be at work, involved and cooperating in the work of each other? At peace, comfortable with and at ease with one another. What if we could only truly be ourselves when we are in community with one another? at peace together or at peace alone. You see, that's one of the lessons that I'm learning from the, looking at God as Trinity. And from my reading of Scripture, it isn't possible for Jesus to be Jesus without the Father and without the Holy Spirit. And you might think, well, that's obvious. <laughs> well, yes, but think about the way we talk about Jesus. There are times we talk about Jesus like, Actually, he can do a pretty good job without the Father and without the Holy Spirit. As if Jesus is a lone ranger, come down, he's going to sort everything out. And we often say, don't we, what would Jesus do? And we can have those bracelets, and it's true. It's a good thing to ask. However, 
You may as well ask, well, what would the Father do? Because if Jesus saw the Father doing stuff, and if the Father does everything that Jesus is supposed to follow the Father, we could just ask, what would the Father do? Or what would the Holy Spirit empower Jesus to do? Now, those are longer statements, and we'd need bigger, bigger wristbands. But you see what I'm trying to say? It's not simply we follow Jesus. It's we follow Jesus who is in deep relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, I am uh, partly an introvert. For those of you who spent sort of time one-on-one -on -one with me, you'll probably know this. Um, and I've confessed this before. And for some of you, it might be that going to a party with 30, or it could be 50 these days, couldn't it, if it's outdoors, 30 people you don't know. And getting to know them and mixing with them in that party, and you may think, that is my idea of a good time. 30 people I don't know, spending time for hours with them. Well, great, some of us are made that way, um, but that is not my idea <laughs> of a good time. It doesn't mean I won't enjoy some of it, but it would exhaust me. 30 people I don't know, having to get to know them and spending time in confined space with them for hours on end. Now, a walk on my own, or, or with uh, one or two people, or spending time one-on-one -on -one with people on a walk. Now, that's my idea of fun, especially if we never meet another person. <laughs> it's the perfect walk for me, but that's just me. <laughs> Some of us are just made that way. But if I'm made in the image of God, whether I'm an introvert who just likes one-on-one, -on -one, or whether I'm an extrovert who wants to be around hundreds of people, I was still made for community, for relationships. If God as Trinity is the perfection of relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in constant communion, then I was made in that image. The Bible says, doesn't it, right at the beginning, let us make man in our image. That's the image of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit image. And that means I was made to relate, whether it's just one-on-one -on -one <laughs> or whether it is 30 or 40 people. Made to relate to God, made to relate to others. And if that's true of me, then so will you. And part of our purpose as a church is to enable people through the grace and mercy of God in Jesus and through what Jesus has done to be fully alive, fully relational with God and with each other. I've been reading a lot of a, a guy called Dallas Willard and he said this, and you may agree or disagree, but I'm going to agree, so I'll read it to you. The most important thing in your life is not what you do, it's who you become. That's what you will take with you into eternity. The most important thing in your life is not what you do, it's who you become. You see, we can be so driven towards achieving something. What's my mission? What's my purpose? I want to achieve something. So much so that we can neglect that we should be becoming someone. You see, we need to be shaped and we need to be formed into someone. That is why I'm convinced we should be spending more time thinking and getting to know who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that we know who we should become, how we should be molded. That's discipleship. We often think of discipleship as being, you know, gaining the skills in order to achieve something. Whereas I believe discipleship is becoming someone in Jesus, following after Jesus. We had a session on ethos on Thursday night where this, uh, this church leader was talking about how his church uh, went through some difficult times. And uh, he recognised that in himself, during those difficult times, he was not a good person. He said, I might have made the right decisions, 
but actually sometimes it's not going to a meeting to make the right decisions. It's going to a meeting to be the right person. Whatever those decisions are made. The first man, Adam, failed in the most fundamental way. He broke the relationship, the trust, the obedience between him and God. And from that moment on, all our lives are characterised by imperfections in our relationships. It's just how we're made. And yet Jesus, the second Adam, succeeded. He lived out what Adam should have been. Truly becoming a person by the perfection of his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That is true personhood. So in the light of this understanding of the Trinity, we can ask, who are we becoming? If Jesus couldn't truly be Jesus without the Father and the Holy Spirit, and if he was not able to be all that he could be, unless he was in that community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does that mean for us? We are being drawn into that community through Jesus. And if I am, and if you are, then we are. And for me, that throws an important question to light when it comes to mission. And I don't think this is an either-or answer, but I'm going to pose it like it's an either-or answer to, to give you folk a chance to think it over. So I'm not saying either one is right and either one is wrong, but are we trying to save individual souls or are we drawing people into the community of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit? You might say, well, the two are the same. Great. Then let's phrase it like that. So I just want to remind us again that we can get lost in theological debate about the Trinity. And people like me actually find that quite interesting. <laughs> Sad that I know, I do. But the big question for us is, okay, if God is Trinity, what does that mean for me? And who am I becoming because of it? And perhaps the biggest lesson we can learn from this is that if Jesus went into the world not as a lone ranger, but as a member of a perfect community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to achieve what he needed to achieve, can we do anything but follow in his footsteps? The church as an expression of the perfect community. I say as an expression because we'll get it wrong. People being drawn into the perfect community of Father, Son and Holy Spirit through the church. That's the glory of the Trinity. You see, the Trinity is not something to be explained, but someone to be worshipped. Let's pray. Father, Father, we only know how to pray to you because of what Jesus said. When you pray, pray, Father. And so we pray to you because Jesus showed us how. And Father, we pray to you because we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives to convince us of who you are and what you are doing and what you have done. Father, on this uh, Trinity Sunday, Lord, help us not to get lost in confusion, but instead find some clarity in what this means for us. Lord, you are the perfect community. Father, help us as your people, as your church, as an expression of that perfect community here in Welshpool to know what it means. 
and to worship you for who you are. Even though we may see as, it, as through a glass darkly, one day we will see face to face. Lord, we worship you. We give you thanks. And we come before you and say, have your way in our lives and in our church. In Jesus' name we ask all of these things. Amen.